our speakers today is entitled entitled Sophisticated or Simple Finding the Point of Diminishing Returns on Digital Expenditure. Presented by Peter Rees, who is an agile associate professor at the American University in London, who provides consultancy service in analyzing, planning, and implementing business policy. Another way of putting his title is Could You Spend Less and Get Broadly the Same Results? And just before he starts, the health warning. The uh, views expressed by the speakers are their own, and neither their employers nor the Washington Company of Information Technologists and subsidiaries are responsible for them. Peter, over to you. Thank you very much. So, what I'm going to talk about today is could you get the same results for spending less money? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't know if you saw what we did there setting up a smooth way of transition across <laughs> the last speaker's meeting. Did you see that? How many of you use PowerPoints in your day to day present life? You just become a very PowerPoint in business. I guess that's most of you. Did you know you can do this? You can just walk up to the stage in the dark and auditorium, the hush of an enthralled audience, and you can just go like that, and your presentation will start instantly. One thing, one key. When somebody asks you a question, so that they're not distracted when you answer it, you can just do the same thing again. Turn off your presentation, answer the question, and then seamlessly come back. And so I again, did you know you could do that? You didn't, did you? You do that by hitting the B key, because B turns your presentation B to black. And so for no extra money, not only you get advanced marketing, but PowerPoint presentation skills. <laughs> Our excuse is in actual fact that uh, real people in computing don't use Macs and are uh, fluent uh, by the Mac in the first Just as an aside, by the way, yours is a non speaking part of this presentation. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you hit the it turns it white. So just a complete spray. What I'm going to do is spend about the next uh, 35 to 40 minutes talking to you from my perspective. And I'm going to start off by explaining to you my background and my career. I've got quite a few slides, but I'll go through it very quickly because I've got quite an unusual view of digital marketing. If you understand my background, you'll see why, uh, perhaps understand why I'm saying things I do. So basically, I've got about 42 years of international business experience. Behind this boyish exterior, I've actually been in business quite a long time. The first 26 of my years of my career were at IBM, and I started off as a systems programmer, programming in a language called Assembler, which is a very deep technical language. So actually, I do have quite an in-depth understanding of technology, but I don't use any of it anymore today. I then went on, I became a systems engineer, which is a sort of technical person who advises people how to optimize their use of technology in business. I do the same thing today, but from a marketing perspective. So I'm not technical anymore, but I could plan to do it. I then spent about 10 years being a salesman for IBM, so selling high value computer systems to mostly uh, UK companies, but some international companies. So I then went on to become an international account manager, looking after IBM to deliver accounts. Uh, around the world. I then went into sales training and finally ended up as a sales manager. I then went into marketing and just before I left IBM I was responsible for marketing IBM's hardware brands for Europe. In 2000 I was headhunted and I became vice president of marketing for a global publicly quoted media company. I worked there for six and a half years. In that company we had a turnover of about 400 60 million euros, and we have 650 publications and 65 websites in 22 countries. And from that revenue, 46 million of it was online. So about eight years ago, I was running a business, an online business, which was turning over 46 million euros. So I spent a lot of my time worrying about how to optimize and make the best use of investment in digital. And that's what I'm going to share with you for the rest of my presentation today. <coughs> Nowadays, I've come back from uh, Paris, where I worked for that company. We sold that company in 2006 for 1.3 billion euros, and I've come back to the UK in 2007. And now I work for money half my time. I have my own marketing consultancy, and you can see the details I have this with your slide handout so you want to get in contact with me. That's my contact details. Um, the other part of this 50% is I was introduced. I'm an adjunct associate professor of marketing at the American International University. And now I teach global marketing strategy on their international MBA program. I also do some work for the Charleston Institute of Marketing, which is the professional body for marketing people. It's got about 42,000 members worldwide. And there I'm a senior examiner for a number of courses and qualifications, including in digital marketing. I'm a tutor, I'm a course developer, and I write some of their questions as well. 
I've recently taken up a post as a lecturer and tutor at the London College of Fashion, where I teach on their master's program, Fashion Marketing Strategy, and a number of their undergraduate courses. And that's part of the University of the Arts of London. 25% of my time I do charity and volunteer work through my little company, which is the Watchful Company of Marketers, and these are just some of the companies that I've done free work for. I've also done work for some um, institutions and galleries. I've done some work for London School, the Royal Ballet School, for um, some of the literary companies, for the Museum of London, for the Museum of Print in London. So I have some experience of sort of events and attraction kind of marketing that most of you are in. And 25% of my time, maybe 25% of my hobbies, which is composing and producing music. I make videos, which I usually give to the charities that I'm consulting for for free. And I'm also interested in magic, technology, and photography. So that's a little bit about me. And now I should get on to my main content today, which is really marketing in turbulent times. Because all of us are facing very great difficulties in getting the best return on our investment in digital marketing, or that, that matter, any other sort of marketing for a number of reasons. First of all, is the great stress and pressure in the economy. And that's both on us as businesses and for the audiences which we are trying to attract. People, <coughs> our customers, your customers, are having less and less discretionary spend. So if you decide to have a night at the theatre, a night at the gallery, a trip to Disney World, a trip to Legoland, or stay at home with a DVD and a take out curry, it's all competing for the money they could otherwise spend on your attractions and uh, your performances. It's the same for us as businesses because we're finding it harder and harder, charities are finding it harder and harder to get income from donors, from sponsors, from grants, and from customer income which they've enjoyed over the past few years. So basically times are tough on both sides, on the buyer and the seller side of the transactions that you're trying to engage with with your markets. And I guess most of you are feeling that kind of pressure. It all falls down to what's actually happening in an underlying sense to the financial realities of the businesses which you all work for or try to consult for. In all of that, the first thing is to return on equity. Owners of these businesses, whether it's charitable trusts, whether it's the government, whether it's board of directors, whether it's trustees, are really wanting to know my investment in this business, in this brand, is it making return on about return on investment, I'm talking about return on equity. My investment, my shareholding in this business, is it returning what it ought to return compared to other places like could put my own money? I'm also from the trustee of the other <coughs> charitable trusts, so I've had some experience of arts, charitable <coughs> arts marketing. I'm also a member of the academicians room of the Royal Academy, so I know the pressures that they're facing as well. At the end of the day, we need to invest in our business, invest in our brand, new capital investments in buildings, in uh, facilities, and in the sort of day-to-day -day running of our businesses. In order to do that, we have to keep a very careful eye on costs and try to maximise the revenue that we get back into our business. But we can be absolutely sure we maximise the return on investment and make sure that our investors in the business do get the maximum return on the equity in the business. So that's the context in which we're talking about today. What I'd like to do now is spend a little bit of time talking about how we could operate with reduced marketing budgets which we're all forced to work with these days. Or think another way, how we get the maximum return on the marketing budgets that we have. And I guess that's something that will be of interest to all of you. The other thing we need to look at is the competition. It's not only the competition from our traditional theatre to theatre, or art gallery to art gallery, or museum to museum competitors, but it's other things that can happen being delivered by different ways, by the internet, by other rich media, so that you can actually experience some of the stuff we would traditionally have delivered live somewhere by a media stream over the internet or broadcast by satellite. And you see examples of where people are now sitting at home and watching live first night of the opera on their TV channel, or a subscription TV channel, rather than actually going to the opera house and watching it live there. Now, digital marketing is very interesting. This is the next big thing. I remember the rise of the internet in about the year 2000. If you didn't have .com in your company name, you must have given up as a marketer. .coms were the things to be. And you may remember in April 2000, about two thirds of the internet businesses were bankrupt on the 1st of April, appropriate days. And about 50% was wiped off the value of the NASDAQ stock market. And lots and lots of .com companies went bankrupt because they had no sustainable business model. It's the same thing today, the hype that happened with the arrival of the growth of the internet. It's the same thing with digital marketing. Because people get very excited 
When I'm at a conference or a talk like this, ask people to put their hands up. I won't ask you to do it, but for example, put your hand up, I say, if your company's got a Facebook page. Put your hand up. So keep that hand up. And put your other hand up if your company Twitters and the other half people, their other hand very, very honest. Say, okay, keep your hand up if you can tell the UI and all that has to go down. There's lots of businesses are now doing digital and social media because it's the good thing to do. They don't actually know why they're doing it. And that has some consequences which I shall next way. What we need to do, I'm going to suggest in my talk to you today, and I'm speaking to you as a marketing person, is to some extent go back to basics. And I'm going to offer you some insights. And the first one is comes from a gentleman called John Wanamaker, who was an American department store owner. And he said, half the money I spend on advertising is wasted. But the problem is I don't know which half. And that's exactly the same problem as we all face with digital and social marketing, social media. We spend money on it, we invest in it, we get people in our companies to do it. But actually, we don't always know why, what it's actually doing for us. So that's one thing, that's the 50% rule. Let's use another gentleman again. I don't know if you know who that is. Do you know who that is? He's an engineer. He's a social commentator, and he's a social historian. I think his name is Alfredo Perito. Perito, remember? Perito invented this, the 80-20 rule. Perito, by the way, was also a social scientist. He was the first person to use the word elite in a social circumstance. He's an Italian gentleman, died in about 1928. And what he noticed was 80% of the land in Italy was owned by 20% of the people. There was this wealthy upper class, 20% of the rich Italians over 80% of the land. And he looked at different things in business and in commerce, and that 80-20 rule seemed to happen time and time again. It's the same with Amazon. Amazon get 80% of their revenue by 20% of their stock items. If you're running a commercial organization, business to business, you'll probably find you get 80% of your revenue from 20% of your total customer base. And some underlying reason, which nobody quite understands, but it's provable, this 80 20 rule seems to work again and again and again throughout commerce and throughout business. So, that being the case, and if we turn that 80 20 rule onto social media, which is what I've been asked to talk to you about today, we come up with an obvious question. If 80% of the results come from 20% of the investment, which they do, 80% of your um, Facebook likes come from 20, or Facebook traffic comes from 20% on your paid advertising for Facebook. 80% of your search engine paid advertising comes from 20% of the paid for search ads that you put on. 80% of your traffic where there's a link comes from 20% of the tweets. So the question is, how do you turn an investment? You can spend a thousand pounds on, let's say, paid advertising on Google links down the side of a search page. And 80% of the traffic will come from 20% of the spend. Similarly, I could spend a thousand pounds on Facebook advertising and 20% of the traffic, sorry, 80% of the traffic come from 20% of the spend. And that's the, the case time after time, whether you've invested in direct marketing, Facebook, Twitter, search engine marketing, search engine optimization, um, paid advertising, TV advertising, great advertising. 80% of the traffic will come from 20% of the spend. So to answer the question that I was asked to talk about today, yes, you absolutely can save money. And the way you do it is by knowing which of the investments to drop. Everything's been to 80 20 that's an immutable sort of underlying law of business. But what you have to think about is which of, well, if I'm doing a multitude of portfolio of advertising or marketing things, which are the less effective ones because the 80 20 rule will drop. You can drop 80% of them is only 20% of the generating results. So if you're doing a portfolio marketing activity, you need to understand and measure which of the 80% feel you like are redundant or the 80% poor performance, and those are the ones you can scrap um, to get to the 20% which really make a difference. Just as an aside and a bit of geography for you, did you know, this is just another unusual factor, well, imagine a river flowing from a mountain up in, sort of river up in the mountain, it flows, it wanders down, through the land and it comes out and it goes into the sea. If you measure the actual course of the river, if you measure it all its bends as it zigzags through the world, to the sea, and if you measure it end to end, you divide the big number, the meandering length, by the end to end length. 
it almost always comes out as pi for any brick in the world. And again, nobody knows why. So it's not only that you get some PowerPoint presentations in that mark, you get some obscure geographic mathematical facts as well for still no extra money. What you need to have are some of the faults missing here. He says, I have a cunning plan, I should say. <laughs> what you need, ladies and gentlemen, is a cunning plan. And when I invite them to speak to charities, 90% of the time, they invite me to do things like, can I have a look at their brochure? Can I help them to redesign their brand or their logo? Can I get them some advice on their website? Or can I tell them what social media is all about? And 90% of the time, that question is not the one that I answer. Because what I've found is, my first observation, is that many organizations, especially not-for-profit, are absolutely, totally rubbish at marketing planning. And what they really need to do is not get me to redesign the logo, or top up a brochure, or tinker with their homepage, is to help them do a proper, professional marketing plan. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about briefly, really, and then develop that, and show you which bits of it are relevant to answering the question that I've been asked to tell you about today. Is that okay? Am I going too fast, by the way? Right speed? That encourages all some traction. If you ask a question, not. <laughs> most people want to not when you do. Just a tip. Is that okay? Right. So, marketing planning. Marketing plans answer six questions. And if you can remember these six questions and spend some time answering each one, then you'll find a decent marketing plan. And the first question that a marketing plan answers is S for situation. And it answers the question, where are we today? And unless you establish where your business is today, then you can't start your journey. If you know where you're starting from, you can't possibly plan your journey. And this is the area of market research and marketplace assessment. What are our competitors doing? What's happening in the world? The economic situation, the, ge the demographic situation. Who's got money? What's their ages? What's their education level? What are our competitors doing? Are there any new entrants coming into the marketplace or substitute products like people delivering theatre performances over the internet or streaming on satellite TV? So the first thing to do is ask the question, where are we today? And most companies, most businesses, in my experience, don't spend sufficient time to what I would call proper quantitative, qualitative market research at least once a quarter. I think they know the business and they don't. The second question is to do with the area of objectives, which is where are we going? And I'll talk about this in a couple of slides time because this is one of the most important areas and this one often the charities and non-profit organisations do the worst. I'm going to give you five examples of how you can set objectives and then give you advice on the best method. Because unless we know where we're going, any road will take you. The third question is strategy which answers the question, how will we get there? So where are we today, where are we going, how will we get there? And I have to tell you that strategy is one of the most misused words in business today. People talk management sort of, they said sort of rubbish management strategy <coughs> words, and they have a business strategy, a marketing strategy, an operations strategy, a recruitment strategy, a hiring strategy, a promotion strategy, does that sound familiar? An analysis strategy. It's all rubbish, it's not strategy. Strategy answers two questions, sorry, two questions. The first question is, you can think about this yourself and answer it when you get home. When I'm consulting, I ask boards of directors this, and not one of them can usually answer it. The question is, what is it that makes your business better and different from your competitors in ways that are valued by and add value to your customers that can't be easily copied? What is it that makes your business better and different from your competition? The ways that are valued by our value to your customers that can't be easily copied. And I have to tell you, most people can't answer that. And if you go to the and say, well, we make dot dot dot, or we sell dot dot dot, or we've been in business for 100 years, then uh, that's not answering the question. I haven't got time to tell you why, if you want to know why, contact me afterwards, but that does not answer the question. Well, that question is what needs you satisfy in the customer's life? Not what, you, not what you do, it's what you do for the customer. Which, by the way, I think we've got side, is the difference between sales and marketing. People think marketing and sales are interchangeable, they're not. 
Sales is about finding people to buy what we make or what we deliver. Marketing is about making what people want to buy. It's the other side of the coin. But sales is not marketing. Sales is about trying to find people to buy what we sell. Marketing is about making what people want to buy. Any of these questions, by the way, is a whole eight-hour topic in itself, so I'm just sort of summarizing it a little bit. And the next thing is tactics, which, which way is best. And I'll show you the next slide. There's a whole range of things you can put together to actually deliver the value that I've just talked about in the strategy. Actions is who does what way. Because a lot of time I do marketing planning with charities, and I can't sit in marketing plan after I've helped them, and I go away and come back four months later and not anybody's done anything. Because nobody's going to be given the responsibility or a timetable by which to deliver what was promised. And finally, the thing is control is how to ensure safe arrival. And those letters, SOS TAC, is a planning method invented by my friend Paul Smith. I'll have to mention his copyright, Paul Smith. That's not my original thing, he's Paul Smith. So, source of that. situation, objective, strategy, tactics, action, control. Where are we today? Where are we going? How do we get there? Which way is best? How do we ensure? Who does what when? How do we ensure safe arrival? So, let's just blow that up quickly and show you what it means. And I'll tell you my second observation. Most observations draw the thing I just told you back to front, and therefore they fail. I'll show you why. What you should do is something on this side is do the different elements of source back. Set out, do a situation analysis, set out objectives, identify a clear strategy, put together some tactics. If you've never done any marketing, you might be familiar with a concept called the marketing mix, or the four P's, or now the seven P's, which is product, price, promotion, place, people, process, physical evidence. And that's the totality of all the tools you have available to you to build the offer for your customers. That's, you put those seven elements together and build stuff that you sell your customers. And that's what has value to, and that's what they value. And that's what answers the strategy question I just asked you a couple of minutes ago. Within the seven P's, product price promotion, place, people, process, with governments, is P for promotion. And that's all about marketing communications and messaging. And you, that answers our three questions, which is message, market, method. What do we want to say, whom do we want to say it to, and how do we deliver it? Among the methods is loads of stuff, and here's a list of all the methods available to you that I can think of. So you've got personal selling, blah, 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 selling sales off. And these red ones here, I just like that because I've been asked to talk to you today about digital marketing. And those red ones are the things that we can deliver online by digital media. The last one is interesting, social media, and that's been referred to by other talks you've had today. And as long as you have available in there are things like Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Pinterest, Instagram, and so on. Now, the reason I just said that most companies do this backwards, from my experience, many companies just focus today on this bit down here, social media, because it's the hot thing to do. Are they, are they very proud to put their hands up in conferences? Yes, well, I've got a Facebook page, I tweet, I've got Instagram, I've got thousands of Twitter followers, but they don't know why. It's pointless doing this. Unless you're doing it in the context of an integrated mix of methods to deliver a message to the market you've chosen, within the context of an overall marketing mix, within the context of a properly constructed marketing plan. And that's why I say lots of businesses do it the wrong way around. You have to start here, do all this, do all this, and then work go down and cross, down and cross, down and cross, down and cross. And unless you do, it's like trying to make a car go faster by punching the hubcaps, it's pointless. It might be cosmetically pretty, it will not one change of miles per hour, one a set. So my third observation is that many organizations are very poor at objective setting budgeting. So I said, unless you know where you're going, any road will take you there. And many charities that I deal with are very poor at setting objectives. The five methods. This is my favorite. This is on charity issues. So how do you set your objectives? I said, well, it's quite easy, I think. Take last year's revenue, and we want to grow that by 10%. We want to cut our costs by 10%. So it's a plus 10, minus 10. Do it last year, revenue goes up 10, cost down 10. But eventually, if you work it out, you'll just implode. You'll get an infinite amount of money from no expense, which is definitely impossible. But also, it's like trying to navigate your car by looking in the rear view mirror. Look in the past and using it to predict the future. The point is, what you do is look into the future. Because last year, it may have been a major recession. We may have seen a major donation. 
You may have launched a brand new show with some mega stars in the and pass through Broadway. So what happened last year doesn't in any way affect what's happening this year. If you understand mindfulness, record told, mindfulness said it's all now, it's the now is the matters, and the future will happen when it happens. So don't use that method, don't use the plus 10, minus 10 method. The other one is called, the polite word for it is competitive parity. I'll spend about the same as my competitors. Companies have you can get all of your competitors and your accounts so if you know that. Anyone is a limited company or a charity. Charity commission website get all its charity accounts to the charity. It's a limited company, you go to the company's house and for one pound you can put all your competitors profit and loss and balance sheets. But if you do that, and often they're very convenient to say how much they spend on marketing. And you can work out marketing as a percentage of total revenue as a percentage of the revenue of marketing and you can copy them as well. Well, that is like lying in the kitchen with your head in the oven <laughs> and your feet in the freezer because on average you'll be at a comfortable temperature. <laughs> <laughs> you can spend loads of money, just think of you, you can spend loads of money on research to become average. <laughs> this is a financial correct here. You see what before. <laughs> and the third method of setting budget is what's called affordability. Many companies see marketing, they call it the colouring in department. <coughs> marketing do sort of brochures and things like that. It's a colouring in investment. And they do tweeting and Facebook and that sort of thing. Affordability is whatever was left over, basically. Nobody else has got the money, what's left over is marketing, which is a very stupid way to run your business, quite honestly. The next way, the next way is a percentage of sales. So, right, whatever I sell, I'm going to spend 8% of it on marketing. What's the wrong way around? Marketing drives sales. Sales doesn't drive marketing. You need to understand what's the lead, what's driving things, and what's the results are. So spending 10% or 8%, 5% of what you've sold is irrelevant because it's self around. What you invest in marketing should drive sales. So this method of percentage of sales is also rubbish. The way you should do it, I contend, is like this, which is called objective and task. You decide what you want to achieve. What objectives do you want to achieve? Is it likes? Is it traffic? Is it visits? Is it e-commerce results? Is it bums on seats? Is it amiability? All these larger than talked about. Which of those do you want to achieve? And therefore, how much money would you need to achieve them? Now, in the beginning, you may not know everything. But eventually, over time, the experience, you have built up a sort of knowledge base of what you need to spend to achieve what outcome. And then you can start doing the 80 of Pareto thing, saying I want to achieve these way. These are the 20% of things I really want to achieve. Well, the 80% of things I want to achieve, and this is the 20% of my total budget I need to spend to do it. So that's how to set budgets. Many people suffer from what I call premature objectification. Very embarrassing problem, a lot of people don't talk about it. But if you're a charity or a business, I say, hey, sometimes it's, what are your objectives? And they say this. Increase awareness and improve satisfaction. Well, saying it like that is completely pointless rubbish for the following reason. They don't know what it is today. They say, I want to increase my customer satisfaction. Say, they want it today. I want to improve, improve awareness. What, what's the awareness of your brand today? What do you want it to go to by the way? Assuming you did know what it was today, you could measure it some quantifiable way. How much you want to achieve, increase it by about well, double it in 10 years, right, 10 to 75, five years, three points in six months, so they don't have that. But they've got no clue how to measure it anyway. So they have really wifty wafty objectives like this. They don't know what they are today, they don't know where they want to change them to, and they don't know how to do it anyway. So if you have objectives, don't have nanny pound you wafty ones like this. <coughs> Which are very common charities, have quantifiable, proper, specific ones. I'll talk a little bit more about that later so, on. And finally, they don't have anything, not planning to do anything to drive it. So I don't know where I'm today, I don't know where I'm going, I don't know how I'm going to get there, I've got an no idea what I should do to get there, I've got no idea what I'm going to do. So, observation for the best results when you're doing marketing communications after you've done the message the market and the method as big list of tools is which ones are you going to use? Now, marketing communications is not about having nice brochures 
or golf umbrellas, or key rings, or mouse mats, because we are not the colouring in department. We're proper marketing people. Now, this wonderful promotion merchandise is at best noise level and at worst a waste of money. And thank you for the mark taken on my way out, by the way. Anyway. <laughs> Apart from that, no for business. Integrated marketing communications means you should use all those tools that I talked to you about, PR, advertising, email, direct marketing, and use them consistently, integrated along 77 different levels. The first one, which have corporate objectives which go down to marketing objectives which go down to advertising objectives, and that should all flow and be consistent going sort of hierarchically down in the organisation. You need horizontal <coughs> objectives, so marketing and sales and distribution or manufacturing or research or web design all do the same things consistently. I was recently doing three pieces of consulting work for a big cathedral just over the river with the dome roof. <laughs> I'm advising them on their digital marketing. Which is, I decided, I suggested one of the things they should do is they should launch online, they should they want to get revenue, they should sell more digital recordings of all the music that they acquire, see. And what I suggested they should give away a free Christmas carol MP3 download, one track of free choir singing something, a white manager, and then if you liked it, download it, send that person a special offer that they could buy a CD at a discounted rate and some Christmas cards and some floors for people at the store for talking to them and some CDs as well. The answer will never come up with that because the choir won't let us sell their music. I need you to think about that. The marketing mix is the product price promotion place and all those should be coherent with the packaging, the product, the pricing should be consistent with what we're trying to communicate. The tool should be the same. So why don't you say on online, on Twitter, on Facebook, on your website, on your adverts, on your brochures, on your mouse match, your brochure, key groups, <coughs> um, should be consistent. Internal and external, so needs to be consistent design. Internal and external, get your employees involved in this. They're your, among your biggest salespeople. They're the ones who interact with your audience on a day to day basis. Get them to understand and sell for you as people come in. And make sure you get adequate budget. Uh, to do the work that you want. So those are the levels of integration and integrated marketing. Make sure that everything is consistent and drives towards the objectives which you set once you've done the previous analysis. Finally, you need to think about what to measure. Now, we've had lots of talks about marketing metrics from other speakers today. Just to point out to you, there are nine I've written courses on marketing metrics from Manchester University. And nine different areas that you can measure each one of those is a couple of days talk, and please don't want them to do any more of that. But just think of all the things you can measure, and if you want more advice, contact me afterwards. <coughs> People obsess about ROI. It's not just improving, it's not just proving ROI, you really think how to improve it. So measuring ROI is all very good, but really think about context how to make it better. It's not an end in itself given ROI. Let me just give you an example. I don't know if any of you in your businesses try to drive things through e-commerce on your website. You want people to buy things from your website. This is a typical model of a business that's doing that. First, you want to buy called lead magnets. And what we're trying to do is drive traffic to your website through Facebook, through search engine marketing, through search engine optimization, through direct mail for advertising. If you're an e-commerce business, all of your communication mix, your administrative communication, is basically driving people to your website. Yeah? Because what you want to do is get people to come to your website and hopefully they'll be good leads. What they'll do is they'll go through to your e-commerce platform, they'll buy a ticket, they'll buy a t-shirt, they'll buy a visit, they'll buy something, a CD, a book, whatever it is you're selling. And then hopefully in the future they might come back, they might buy something else. Or best of all, they'll tell a friend about you. Okay, now, I'm going to tell you about the buckets of doom now. In this book, there's lots of buckets of doom where things go horribly wrong. And just think whether you're measuring these buckets of doom, if you are, what you're doing about it, fix them. The first thing is, not all leads are good leads. Not everybody who comes to your website passes through and goes on to buy something, and comes back and buys something and tells their friends. Quite a lot of people fall off your website when they get to the home page, and that's called the bounce rate. And that's a measure of people who just come to your website, visit the home page, and leave again. Now you can measure that, and you learn it tells you the bounce rate. 
But the point is, are you doing anything to understand why they're bouncing? Some companies I work with have a 95% bounce rate. So they spend all this money on driving leads. 95 out of 100 of them come to the home page and go, And that's all about website usability. Making your website easy, navigable, clear. There's a whole separate topic about website usability. The next thing to understand is that many people don't buy things immediately. Research in America has shown that when visitors come to an e-commerce website, on average, they make eight or 10 visits before they buy their first thing. So what you need to do is capture people's email address and start a conversation with them. If you bought any subscription products, like I have a guitar, so I bought some online like guitar lessons, so I peer up and buy download the lesson. But I'm not getting every day, every day, I get an email from the guy who runs the business with someone snippet or a video or some tablet or something about guitars. It's fantastic for free. Because he's got constant communication going with you. Now, when he puts that offer for a new blues guitar solo CD, I'm going to buy it. Because I like it. He's been talking to me for six months every day. And he does me a deal. So I buy it. So keep talking to customers. Even if they buy on day one, get their email address. They come from the page. Keep their email address and start talking to them. Tell them about your Christmas offer the next season. Things a backstage tour, um, free thing, discounts of music, discounted tickets, family offers, whatever it happens to be. Lost customers. Once people have bought something from you, you get research and record shows. In America, on e-commerce sites, sixty percent of the people who bought something once, they never speak to it again. So think of that. You've got a customer. They've come to your website, they've bought something, you've got their credit card details, your email address, you know what they've bought, and you never talk to them again. It's just disgraceful. Well, that's common in America. So once you have got somebody to buy something, which is why Amazon is so good, if you buy something from Amazon, you sign up for it, you get recommendations once a week, the, the, the email saying, because you bought this, we might like that. I would say I spend, well, I probably buy about a thing a month from Amazon, just because they send me to weekly and I'll tell you about the new stuff by the authors I like, or the musician, or the band, or the artist, or whatever. And finally, you'll miss a huge opportunity if you don't contact these customers to get them to buy something else. When you have a new offer, a new season, a new range, a new product, write and tell them. Give them an offer, give them a deal. And best still, ask them to refer a friend. Because you bought this, who else do you, who do you know who you think might also be interested and in get referrals from your customers to their friends, their family, their contacts? And that's the most uh, uh, positive recommendation for customers, one of the strongest things you can have. So six metrics for channel performance. And I, you've probably had more technical detail of this, and I'm, I can't do the technical, but I'm not just doing the high level. Measure, first thing, is website conversations. Who's coming to your site? What are they doing when they're there? How long are they staying there? What are they looking at? And capture their email address. Build a database and tag it. Find out where they came from and what they're interested in and start that conversation. The second metric is the value. What are they spending? How much? How often? What are they buying with what? And that supermarket is a great example. They've got the cars and they're to sell. Do measure return on investment. It is important. How much you spend to generate all this traffic to your site and all the media? How much you spend here on all the tools I've talked about, advertising, PR, social media, and what's return and done. You're getting 80% of your average and 20% of your spend. So dump the rest. Okay, understand what is generating value for your business. What's the average rate? How many how many people come to your e-commerce site? How many people go through the click transaction? How many abandon their basket halfway through? How many people don't even get there? Measure those and track them. And start to do a calculation of the customer um, catch. How much are they spending with you compared to your, your investments? So this is really a digital online version of return on investment. That's how to calculate it. How much you get in as a percentage of the money you spend out? That's the sort of highest level ROI you get for digital business. For those of you who have, I won't go all these in detail, for those of you who have physical people involved as well as e commerce, some of you have a sales force or a call center or people phone up all things, you can also measure the physical activity of the people linked to what's happening online as well. And there's various sales, sales force automation tools 
like Marketo or um, Infusionsoft. There's about five or six different standard patches that set up, Salesforce is another one uh, that does all this stuff, which uses this great huge number of fantastic reports that tells you how people move through the sales funnel. People go through four stages when you communicate with them, which is awareness, like the bike they offer, like you It's awareness, interest, desire, action. They know about it, make them aware, become interested in it, they want one, and actually go and buy one, or phone up and buy one, or visit them, or the office, or go on the website and buy one. So you need to think what communications tools are good for the different stages, what's good at raising awareness, what's good at generating interest, what's good at creating design, want, and what's good at making them do something. And there's a whole separate theory about different steps to do those different things. Objectives should be smart. Objectives should be smart, which is specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound. When I'm asking exam papers, the students say objectives, I'm going to increase my revenue by 20%. But they don't say by when. I'm going to increase awareness, but that's the point is how can you measure it by when. So specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, time bound. Reviewed regularly, are they still relevant? The objectives you had last year are not what you need to be doing this year. The world's changed since the last few years. So we change your business model and change your activities accordingly. Look into the past, by all means. Look at what's happening today in real time analytics. But more importantly, predict and look at what's going to happen in the future. And look at what's leading in there. What is driving what? What is driving customer satisfaction? What is driving repeat business? Understand it, focus on those things. And use attribution modeling which is what leads and what lacks. So don't take a percentage of sales to generate your marketing budget, work out from your marketing budget what sales you'll generate. See what I mean? In summary, do proper marketing planning when you use tech or any other model. Set meaningful, quantifiable, task-based objectives which are smart, specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, type-bounded. Integrate marketing communications, all of the different tools, all the different methods, and across the seven different levels of organizational integration I talked about on that other slide. Measure the right things and have a feedback loop and correct things as you go. So don't be just measuring things, oh look, that's happening, that's happening. Do something about it. If you're falling behind on revenue, do something about it. And avoid what I call a happy trap, which is just measuring the things that make you feel good. If, you, if customer satisfaction is not bad, keep measuring customer satisfaction, it's good to the trustees, it's good to the board, but it's not very good if you're bleeding revenue and you're not getting the, the, the occupancy or the throughput the homes on seats. So don't just measure what you've always measured because it makes you feel good, it gives you a nice answer for the board or the trustees. Don't fall into the happy trap. Now this is Charles Darwin who invented the theory of evolution. The main thing that Charles Darwin said it's all about survival of the fittest, but I'll tell you now, Charles Darwin never said that. All Charles Darwin said was this, it's not the strongest of the species that survive, or the most intelligent, but the ones most adaptable to change. So ladies and gentlemen, if you want to survive, be that. Any questions? Stunned silence. <laughs> Okay, well in that case I'd just like to say thank you. And in conclusion, I teach at various universities, I've spoken to lots of conference, business schools, and of all the audiences I've spoken to this year, I have to say that you ladies and gentlemen have been the most recent. <laughs> <laughs> Can you find another question?